Welcome back, everybody, to another reaction video. Well, you're getting a twofer today. I already uploaded once today, but I just couldn't keep myself away from these extra history videos. They're just so good. They set the right tone. They provide a lot of information in a short time. Uh, so I thought I'd dive into another one, and I want to dive into a topic that I really don't know nearly enough about, which is the Eastern Front during World War II. Uh, this specifically, this two-part series, I think it's two parts, is about the Battle of Kursk, which is the largest tank battle ever fought. And just in general, this was a massive, massive battle. And I don't know a lot about Kursk. I know it was kind of the turning point of the Eastern Front in World War II. It's the point at which uh, the, the Red Army, the Soviets, go from being on the defensive to starting to counterattack and starting to push back across Eastern Europe and eventually into uh, Germany itself. Uh, so I'm interested to dive into this. I'm especially interested because I think this will be a great jumping off point for us to have a conversation. I'll be honest, I don't know uh, all that much about the Battle of Kursk, so I don't know how much I'm really going to be adding to what they say other than my own personal reactions to it. So this is really an opportunity for me to learn, but also for us to kind of continue this conversation. Before we dive in, just a couple of things. As always, the link is in the description to the original content. Give them a like, give them a comment, make sure you subscribe to Extra Credits. They have fantastic stuff. Also, some of you have been asking me about merch. What I'm wearing today is actually merch from my gaming channel, History Guy Gaming. Link's in the description for that, by the way. Um, but I am working on merch for this channel. Uh, if you have suggestions, ideas on the kind of merch I could create, I would love to hear it. I'm creating a channel uh, on the Discord server for suggestions about merch. So you can head on over there, or you can just use the comment section below to let me know your suggestions here. But let's go ahead and dive in to Extra History's The Battle of Kursk. Thanks to the folks over at Wargaming, over the next few weeks we're going to be bringing you an additional set of extra, extra history episodes to talk about the Battle of Kursk, the largest tank battle in world history. But first we need to set the scene. It's June 1941. For weeks, Nazi Germany's forces have been building along the eastern frontier. Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia have been working together since the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact of 1939, but that's all about to change. The ideologies, policies, and war goals of these two nations have always been opposed. Tensions have been mounting since the exclusion of the Soviet Union from the Axis alliance between Japan, Italy, and the German Reich. So let's talk about this for a minute. Um, I know the, the most common reason people give for the German invasion of the Soviet Union, uh, Operation Barbarossa, uh, is oil. Um, I have some disagreement with that suggestion. Uh, I understand that Hitler needed oil, which he was trading with the Soviet Union for. Um, I don't think it was nearly as dire and desperate that he needed to invade. I think it ended up hurting him more than it hurt it. It helped. Of course, that's in hindsight. Uh, but I think even more importantly than that, there's an ideological reason for this. Hitler hated the Soviets every bit as much as he hated the Jews. And as far as he was concerned, they needed to be wiped off the face of the earth the same way the Jews did. He also had the, the whole idea of Lebensraum, which is a uh, living space, which was a big part of this. So there are a lot of factors in why he decided to do this. And incidentally, Joachim von Ribbentrop, who was the German foreign minister, whose name is in that uh, pact that was signed, was one of the people who was executed after the Nuremberg trials uh, in uh, 1946. Conflicts over the Balkans have been escalating. Peace cannot last. On the 21st of June, it's time. Panzers race eastward, tearing through the Russian lines. Surprise is total. Moscow's in a state of shock at the invasion. The Soviet troops fight bravely, but their leadership has been gutted by the vicious Stalinist purges. The Wehrmacht juggernaut cannot be stopped. Thousands of Soviet planes are destroyed by the Luftwaffe while still on the ground. Within hours, the Germans have decimated any semblance of command. Suicidal orders from Moscow demand a counterattack. Soviet troops either attempt counterassaults or withdraw piecemeal. Over the next few weeks, hundreds of thousands of Soviet soldiers are captured and sent back to serve as slave labor in the German camps. And much like the Jews who were slave labor, a lot of them starved to death, a lot of them died from the conditions. Uh, they really were not valued as human beings whatsoever. And in the Balkans, the German troops are hailed as liberators by people looking west for salvation from the brutal Soviet regime. But not all is quite as rosy as it seemed for the Nazi Reich. 
Despite the incredible losses suffered by the Soviet army, an unacceptably large number of Soviet troops had been able to slip through the gaps between the racing panzers and the infantry mired in crossing the muddy and insufficient roads of the rural European East. And despite the destruction of so many Soviet aircraft, the front the Germans were fighting on was simply too expansive to control. So let's talk about the aircraft for a second. If you look at a list of the aces, the flying aces of World War II, uh, and an ace was anybody who got at least five aerial victories, um, pretty much most of the top 50 are all Germans. There's a few uh, others uh, in there but almost all of the top aces of the war. And we're talking hundreds of victories each, uh, two, 300 aerial victories. I'm guessing they probably counted the ones that they destroyed on the ground. Some nations did count if you blew up an aircraft on the ground as a victory. I don't know if the Germans did or not, but just look up that list sometime. It's ridiculous how many victories the, uh, the German pilots had. And they'd lost too many pilots and planes in the Battle of Britain. The Luftwaffe simply could not maintain total air superiority in the East. And whatever goodwill the people of the Balkans had toward the invading troops was lost almost instantly due to the ever-mounting number of Nazi atrocities, crimes against what they considered to be an inhuman race. For the rest of the war, there would be almost constant resistance striking the Germans behind the front lines as the army tried to push even further east. As the push east continued and the summer rains set in, the advance slowed. Meanwhile, the Soviets began to reorganize. The holes in the leadership left by Stalin's purges were filled. Competence began to trump ideology when appointing officers. The communication structure was improved, and some semblance of a coordinated battle plan was drawn. The first coordinated resistance came at Smolensk. Thousands of Soviet tanks rushed west in a desperate attempt to halt the German advance. Half a million men on each side clashed in one of the largest operations to date. And if you ever want to just be horrified or blown away by numbers look at the casualty figures in these battles between the soviets and the germans it's just almost impossible to comprehend especially when you get to places like stalingrad when you look at the people who died civilians especially in leningrad uh, it's just mind-boggling it was a disaster for the russians hundreds of thousands more soviet soldiers were cut off and shipped back to germany as slave labor Thousands of tanks were left burning husks in the Russian fields. But as much as this might have appeared to be a total German victory, the Soviet attack had slowed the German advance, costing them time and material that they could not afford, and splitting their command. Many of the German generals wanted to race for Moscow, to keep their forces concentrated and focus on the one objective that might end the war. Hitler instead ordered the army to disperse. And, and I get a lot of people who tell me, oh, well, Hitler was right about that. And I'm not necessarily disagreeing with that. But understand the philosophy of the German generals was kind of similar to the, the philosophy of the Japanese naval command uh, in the Pacific, which was that Japan knew, or at least Yamamoto knew, they couldn't win a long-term war against the U.S. because the U.S. eventually would overwhelm Japan with its industrial might. Uh, same idea here. I think these German generals understood that long term, it was only going to get more favorable for the Soviets. So the the only way that Germans could really win in the East was to knock the Russians out of the war, knock the Soviets out of the war. And the way you do that is to force them into a negotiated settlement, a capitulation. You take their capital, you keep your force concentrated, and you keep destroying their army to the point where they give up. Uh, and of course, that's not what happened. And capture industrial and agricultural centers around the USSR. By September, Nazi German forces were surrounding Leningrad in what would become one of the most desperate and probably most deadly sieges in all of history. What the Germans hoped to be a quick victory would drag out in a brutal battle of attrition for years. By October, bad weather began to set in, and the Luftwaffe's ability to control the sky became severely stretched. By December, the Soviet Air Force had even achieved superiority in some sections of the front. Though offenses had stalled on other fronts, having at last culled the Soviet army to the point where the Wehrmacht nearly matched it in sheer manpower, Hitler ordered one final desperate push on Moscow in the fall before the Russian winter truly set in. At this point, though, supply lines were a problem. Fuel, munitions, and warm clothing couldn't be transported over the vast distance between the German industrial heartland and the Moscow frontier in time. And that's another thing that we don't really get a, 
an easy picture of is the distances we're talking about here. I mean, that, that area to get even to Moscow, which is still pretty much in the western part of the Soviet Union, is a just an incredible distance compared to what they were covering in the west when dealing with France and Britain and, and some of those nations. German divisions were undermanned, and replacements, when they could be found, struggled to make it across the bombed-out roads from Europe to the front. Still, the initial month of the offensive seemed a success. German troops pushed through the defensive rings around Moscow. By the beginning of November, forces of the Third Reich were at the very gates. But the troops were exhausted. There were no reserves, they'd been fighting continually in the ever-worsening Russian weather for months. The troops needed to rest, but every day the Soviets drew in reserves from its vast territory to the east. Bottom line, never get in a land war in Asia. I mean, we should have learned that, right? Uh, from Napoleon? Guess not. Regaining strength. By mid-November, the ground froze, and the final push into Moscow began. But the temperature dropped. In early December, it was sometimes as cold as minus 48 degrees Celsius. The fighting was brutal, and the winter itself claimed many lives. It was too much. The drive on Moscow stopped. Operation Barbarossa had failed. Then the Soviet counterattack began. Week after week, they rolled back the German line. The Soviet forces were better prepared for this harsh winter, and began to regain their footing against the freezing and exhausted forces of the once unshakable German army. But even as the German offensive stalled in the north, a new objective was decided upon in the south, Stalingrad. By summer of 1942, the Wehrmacht began driving toward its new goal, and towards oil fields in the south of Soviet territory. By the fall of 1942, it was clear that the oil fields wouldn't be captured by the onset of winter, so all eyes turned to Stalingrad. The leaders of both nations decided this was the line. Yep. No land beyond the Volga, declared Stalin, and Hitler demanded that this city named after their foe must fall. Within days of the offensive's beginning, the Luftwaffe had reduced the city to rubble. So this reminds me a lot of the Battle of uh, Verdun. Uh, which was a better part of a year, uh, so it was a long battle, much like Stalingrad was, where Verdun kind of became a symbol to where both sides just kind of butted heads and threw everything they had and just bled themselves dry over this one area uh, that ended up mattering much more because of the symbolism of it than it did because of any real strategic importance. This was both, but the symbolism was certainly a big part of it. But rather than surrender, the Soviets just dug into the ruins of the city. Fighting was brutal house-to-house -house combat. Grand strategy broke down into a thousand small actions of a handful of men fighting for the bombed-out remains of a factory or an apartment building. But both sides just kept sending men into the meat grinder that was Stalingrad. By November, the Germans had pushed up to the very banks of the Volga. But even as German troops were approaching the Volga, the Soviets had another plan taking shape. The Germans had been so focused on the city that their defensive line along the front around the city had weakened. This German army had been so used to being on the offensive that it had let its defenses slip, and the Soviets planned to make them pay for that mistake. Soviet forces smashed through the thinly defended lines around the city. And one of the generals who was in command in Stalingrad was Nikita Khrushchev, who later on becomes the head of the uh, Soviet government in the aftermath of uh, Stalin's death in 1953. Crushing the Romanian forces that were supposed to serve as the flank for the German 6th Army in Stalingrad. Rapidly, the Soviets closed the circle. The 6th Army was now pinned, with their forces from Stalingrad on one side and the Soviet counteroffensive push on the other. Initially, a breakout was suggested, but members of the Luftwaffe convinced Hitler that they could provide supplies by air to help the pinned army fight on. Not enough. But it was nowhere near enough. The trapped forces began to starve. Every day, more of the planes so desperately needed for resupply were shot down. A push to relieve the forces was made, but stalled out, as the trapped forces were too exhausted to make a breakout, and their commander was unwilling to defy Hitler's order to hold firm. Remember we talked, uh, if you saw my video yesterday, talking about D-Day. This is what happens when you govern by fear. When you govern by fear, people aren't willing or able to do what needs to be done because of their fear of the leadership. And, and this is just one of so many examples of that with Hitler. At last, the Soviets offered surrender terms to the 6th Army, but the offer was rejected because of Hitler's order. The trapped, hopeless troops fought on. Finally, by the first days of February, resistance collapsed. But even when personally captured, the commander of the 6th Army group refused to surrender. 
1942 turned into 1943, with setbacks in North Africa and the imminent possibility of an Allied front in Italy, there was one last possibility for the Germans to regain the offensive and prevent a collapse in the East. Join us next time for the real beginning of the Battle of Kursk. Yeah, so they talk about offensive, and, and basically, if I understand Kursk right, and I guess we'll get into it tomorrow when we look at the second part, Kursk really begins with the Soviets planning an offensive, but finding out that the Germans are planning one too, and so they, pl they set up a really strong defense, and when the Germans kind of fall into that trap on their offensive, then the Soviets counter offensive and just roll right over them. So uh, I'll be curious to hear your thoughts about everything we've talked about so far, but tomorrow we'll really get into the Battle of Kursk itself. Let me know your comments. Use the comment section below. Hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. We'll see you again tomorrow with part two. Thanks for watching.